If you go look at the comments under my videos on YouTube, you'll see basically two kinds of comments. And one is the kind that comes from people who are totally stuck in their early trauma. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people about the adult symptoms of childhood PTSD and how to start recovering so you can get back on the path toward a happy and connected life. And I emphasize connection because I believe that at its heart, childhood PTSD is an injury to the ability to connect. That injury to connection is the starting point of a whole world of problems that so many of us experienced as a consequence of abuse and neglect in childhood. So to recover from that, I teach people a new way to focus their healing, to shift the focus off the past and off of other people and onto their own symptoms. Because that, right here in the symptoms we have, that is where healing is possible. And even though my message about this is like, I say it so many times, it's like a drumbeat. I still get a lot of comments and emails from people who are on a different path. And some of them are really stuck in a lot of pain. Now, in case you're in that group and you just haven't come to one of my courses yet or my coaching or one of my Zoom calls, I wanna tell you how to get out of that stuck group and into the other group, the group that's not stuck, they're healing, they're moving forward, they're changing their lives. And I'm gonna describe how they're doing it. Now, I'm not a doctor or therapist. I'm just someone who recovered from my own childhood PTSD. And I've learned from both my own experience and from working with thousands of people who went through neglect and abuse in their childhood. And because I've watched some people have amazing breakthroughs that changed their lives, and I've witnessed other people stay miserable and stuck and disconnected, I've come up with a couple of observations. Now, if you're miserable and not progressing the way you want to, the way you, you need to progress, I want you to stay with me here just through the end of the video so you can see what I'm seeing as I hear from all of you who engage with my content about the patterns that are working and the patterns that are really just making people who want to move forward feel miserable. So... Okay, two basic self-concepts that I'm observing. The first is what I notice in people who are working really hard to figure out the problem caused by their experiences and to find the solutions that seem to help them get better. Now, not everything they've tried may have been helpful, but they're active in this project and noticing where they got lifted up and where it didn't really work, where they fell short. And in the comments, you'll, you'll, if you read them, they're sharing these nuggets of their own wisdom. They'll say, I tried X, Y, and Z, and X really sucked, and Y was amazing. And there are clear signs in them, signs that I normally recognize that someone is actually healing. They will say that they're getting along better with people. They feel more at ease uh, in groups or when they're alone. And this is kind of an advanced stage of healing. Their talents and their gifts will start emerging and filling up their lives with a sense of purpose and actions that are helpful to other people. Now for this first group, they're subscribing to my channel because, and this is what they tell me, it's practical, it's solution oriented, it's based on not just theory, but real experience about healing that they relate to. They're feeling not alone anymore. And for people who are having a breakthrough in their healing like this, it feels exciting to try out new tools and ideas and see if there's something in there they can use. They want inspiration, they want action steps, they're ready to go. Now you can tell I like that group, right? But I also love the second group. And these are the folks where the breakthrough simply hasn't happened yet. They're good people, they've worked hard on their healing, and a lot of them are knowledgeable about the treatments out there. And they've tried a lot of them, but the healing has not come. And so this group can be very, very discouraged. And they've come to feel helpless and hopeless. And you can see it in the comments they write, that deep down inside, they've stopped believing that healing is possible for them. That right there. And where that leaves a person, and you see it, it reflected in their comments, is in bitterness. So people who are going through this will have a lot to say about things outside themselves, family members, parents, siblings, exes, the people who said they would help them but couldn't or wouldn't, um, the hospitals or therapists or institutions that made them feel unimportant and unseen. 
And people in this state of discouragement can tell you very clearly what's wrong with all the other people, what ought to change. And, and, and they can tell you what their pain is like. That's common. That's okay. But this second group, the discouraged and stuck group, what's also clear is that they have a very vague or non-existent concept of themselves, of what they'd be like without the emotional pain. The pain becomes everything, as if it's who they are. And so they can't see themselves in a different future state where things have changed for the better. They can't even imagine it and what that might be like, what day-to-day -day life would feel like if they weren't trapped inside their own symptoms. So that's what I mean by stuck. Now, getting stuck in pain and isolation is a very traumatized thing to do. And it happens to everybody sometimes. But if you want to break out of that, you've got to, and you might recognize this phrase from another context, but you've got to break the wheel. And what I mean by wheel is the churning, negative thinking and emotion states that go round and round within us. The blame, the obsession with people who hurt you, the withdrawal from life, the struggling, the failure, the ways you never felt accepted or seen, and the stories that we end up telling ourselves over and over about why we are the way we are. And it's not that these stories aren't true, but if we can't stop the spinning on those stories, the wheel just gets stronger. And the wheel is simultaneously like a vacuum that sucks everything into it. And it's like a centrifuge. It pushes everything off. So it spins and it throws off and scatters everything that you care about. People who love you, wonderful opportunities in your life to have fun or, or have financial security, have joy and humor. It just cool, you know, it just goes away. And as devastating as it is, the wheel is also very seductive because it looks like it's going to make you feel better. And that's why I use this metaphor that you can't just slow down the wheel. You can't just ask it a lot of questions why it is the way it is or analyze it or look at the trajectory of everything it throws off. You just have to shove a big stick into that wheel and break it. And if that's a violent image, don't worry. What you can picture is that the wheel's made of air because it is, it's not even real. And when you break the whole thing, it evaporates like a cloud. It's gone. You thought the wheel was going to make you feel better, but did it? You thought the wheel had ruined your life, but has it? Has it done that already? You thought that the wheel would protect you from triggers of other people, but it doesn't. It actually just kept you stuck in pain and made you see nothing but helplessness. But you know what? You're not helpless. There's a whole wide world of experiences out there. If you can get just a little breathing room, just to get started from that cycle of fear and anger and analysis and diagnosis and blame and more fear, right? Thinking and talking about this stuff doesn't make it go away. It goes away. And remember, all you need is just a little breathing room. It goes away when just for a moment you can release the story and open yourself up to a new and fresh experience of yourself and your capabilities, because you are capable. You're capable in present time of changing these things. Now the focus needs to come off of time past and off of other people and onto the only thing you can heal, which is yourself and the knowledge that right here, right now, through practical steps, you open the door to that healing process by changing your mental state. Now I know that's hard, but I can teach you how to do it. You are not helpless. This is hopeful. For there to be hope, you need to just have a vision, an ideal, and you need to have a belief that healing is actually possible for you inside your own healing. Where, whether or not other people change or circumstances change, this is the crucial sign that someone is on a good path. They recognize their own agency and they begin to see choices. Even when CPTSD puts nothing but horrible choices in front of you, you have a choice. And despite the symptoms you have today, you can move one foot in front of the other toward the healed life that you need, that you deserve. And it starts in the way you regard the possibility of your own healing. Because if you're telling yourself that you're totally damaged, that you're hopelessly screwed up, then whether you mean to or not, you're disconnecting with your life and all the people in it. People generally have a lot of compassion, but when they sense that negative wheel spinning, it's like a hum you can feel in other people, right? And what do you do? You pull away. And the very thing that you're longing for, which is for them to come toward you, to help you, to be connected with you, it can happen. 
And you're like, why can I not get some support? Why doesn't anyone believe in me? Can't they see I need some help? And yeah, it's a harsh place to be. So how do you even begin? If you can just do one thing today, I'll keep it really simple for you. Just get it into your mind, what it will feel like when your PTSD reactions to life are reduced. You wanna give it a little try? Okay, let's take a minute and walk you through it. Imagine that you're in a stressful situation that's normally triggering for you, a party, um, being at work, getting your feelings hurt by somebody you care about. Now remember what it's like when you start getting dysregulated and reactive to the situation, okay? We're just gonna dwell on that very briefly. Don't go way into it, but just, just try to remember what that's like. You might feel tight, your heart races, you, you wanna lash out, maybe you wanna go silent, you wanna get numb, and you get scared that that same old part of you that screws things up and always comes out when you're triggered is gonna happen again. Okay, that's all you have to do, let that go. Now, in comparison, Imagine you're in that situation, but your PTSD symptoms are 50% less, all right? You feel a little rise when you're triggered, but it doesn't go over the top. You don't lose control. You still have choices about what you say, what your facial expression is. You can decide to stay in the situation or not stay. You have that flexibility. So would that kind of reduction in your symptoms change how that all turned out for you? Would that make a difference in your life if you could do that long-term whenever stressful situations came up? Would, would being strong in this way allow you to change some of your circumstances, um, relationships, career, physical health, your ability to share your gifts with the world? Things you couldn't even imagine before because you've been working so hard just to try to see how you get from where you are to just a little bit ahead. But now there's something way more possible out there for you. And if you can just let that in a minute, what you've just done is you've joined the ranks of the first group I described, the ones who can see a better future and who are more likely than anyone else to actually get there. So see if you can let that in today. You can just kind of sit with it or you can take action steps on it. You can click on the links to my courses if you want to. They're always below my videos in the description section. And if you're only ready for one small step though, try this. Just stop telling yourself the terrible story of your life. You break the wheel when you can believe and connect with a better vision of yourself. And then when you start taking action on it, even if it's small action, it leads to change. You can do this. I've seen many, many people with really difficult pasts begin with small steps in that positive direction, and then it gains momentum and it gains momentum, and soon real substantial life changes are carrying them off into the future. And this can happen for you. You can change. I read a short story last week that was about emptiness and love. And in that funny thing that happens sometimes, three different people wrote to me within about a 24 hour period about emptiness and love. And I think a lot of us are thinking about those things right now. There's this harsh, empty, loveless feeling that keeps swooping into consciousness just for a sec during this quarantine period of our lives. But it's sounding the alarm that something huge might be missing from our lives. And like this one woman said, I know you'll think I'm crazy for holding on to the hope that some big love is gonna come into my life and save me. Well. A lot of people might say, yeah, that's crazy, and they'd have some platitude about loving yourself or something, but I won't. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people how to heal from the effects of trauma during childhood. And one of the harshest effects of early trauma is the injury to our ability to connect with other people. It's like a chronic feeling that love can't get in, or a scared reaction when love does show up, or a set of defenses that block love from ever showing up at all. And as hard as it is to be staying at home right now with all the fears about money and safety and the future that this triggers, we, we actually have an incredible opportunity at the moment to go ahead and, I can't believe I'm saying this, experience that empty feeling. And I mean, normally there's a lot to distract us from it, whatever it was for you, shopping, vacation plans, work goals, dating apps, weed, meds, money, whatever made you feel like happiness was just around the corner for you. But with all those distractions diminished right now, what we're left with is all the crap that was under the rug, everything we put there, what all these letters I'm getting are about, that emptiness we're feeling. 
the instinctive knowledge that we are incomplete in a tragic way because we haven't fully experienced love. Now, nothing could be more important, by the way, just in case you're still beating yourself up and calling yourself crazy. I know I'm always saying how critical it is to face reality, to not get stuck in blame and fantasy that completely gives away the control of your own happiness because that's fatal to your progress. But real love is not a fantasy. The fact that you long for it is natural and right and needs to be listened to. And that's why I'm saying that the emptiness you feel during this lockdown is trying to tell you something. It's a gift. We all need the courage to accept this gift, which means facing that emptiness for now and letting the tears come if you have to and letting the awareness come too that you've been suppressing about the nature of your loneliness. Not so much where it came from, we know that, but why really is it happening now? And what would it take to free yourself to change and heal so that you could, in increasing ways, open yourself to love? Now, with childhood PTSD, it's so common to feel, especially after an experience of loss, like we're outside of love, like other people are in this world of goodness, but we're stuck outside the gates, like orphans. <laughs> But remember, you can't be exiled from your own experience. Alone is always where we start, but our healing from all the false ideas that trauma taught us can bring us forward into being inside, in love, inside it. And by that I mean feeling it, sharing it, knowing it, having the highest experience of it that people can have, at least for a little bit in your life. It's that full experience of love that everyone is longing for. And it's not really a thing you do or you, that you get, it's a state of consciousness that you go into. And I think this is why it feels like a walled city when you're on the outside of it. Trauma or no trauma, it can be hard to come in from that place, but it's the place to aim and it's worth fighting for. So I think before too long, this lockdown will end and I don't know about you, but I wanna face everything that isolation has been teaching me because I have so much I wanna learn and become. And normally I'm making videos and programs about practical changes to make life full, right? And I've got a bunch of new videos and a new program lined up and that's coming out soon. But today, while this worldwide isolation is still weighing heavily on us, I wanted to make this one special video about not the fullness of life, but the emptiness, especially now when so many people are feeling like it's too much to bear and they want to escape it or control it somehow. But what if you just let it happen with all the dignity within yourself and the safety of knowing that the isolation is going to pass and the distractions will return with full force very soon and you can hide in them if you want. But what if just for today, you just faced it, this emptiness, this space in you where childhood trauma stole your, your natural ability, ability, your instinctive knowledge of how to love. And even though you've created a lot of good in your life, it drove you toward the sorrow and the regrets that are haunting you right now. I have great news. There's still time. And this is what I wanted to say to the people who wrote me and I wanna shine a light on a few myths that need to be set straight so that even as we take practical common sense steps to heal our lives, we aim not at being just commendable or reasonable or appropriate, but at being fulfilled and at reaching the place that we're longing for, that we were born to find, okay? So first is real love is not a transaction and it can't be negotiated or demanded of anyone. What you didn't get as a child is gone and it can't be replaced by humans. But real love is still here and what shows up in your life is a gift to you from something far more powerful than yourself. And the reason this longing for love won't go away is because you're made for it. And the reason it's so liberating when it happens is because for once you don't have to be a genius and work hard and make something happen. It just arrives in our hearts one day as naturally as hunger or sleep, but it's not cyclical like that. It's a transition, a maturation, something more like puberty really. And it takes over and you change whether you want to or not. But it's not coming merely from the body and we don't seem to be able to choose whether it begins. We can choose a lot of things, including 
many forms of love like duty and service and being part of a family and taking care of other people. And those can go a long way toward healing that emptiness. But that big love that's signaling itself through the emptiness you feel is not something that you can make happen. It's more like it's making something happen through you. And they're good things, even though it can make things pretty messy, but good things that ultimately benefit you and the other person and perhaps everyone. Now, you can screw it up, definitely. You can distort it and try to turn it back into some kind of negotiation or get obsessed on it or destroy it even because everything good in life can be abused. And if you have childhood PTSD, you've already absorbed way more than your share of that. But you can't remove real love out of existence so long as it's flowing through you. It may be inconvenient or terrifying, but when it's happening, even with all the emotional overreactions of CPTSD, all you can really do is your best. And you just try to be honorable. You don't be a jerk. You don't act like an entitled little baby or you don't pull emotional blackmail moves, right? We just have to do our best, even when we don't know where it's going. Even if it usually turns out that you don't get what you would have wanted, there's a way to go through it that deepens you and makes you stronger. You've been conscripted into the greatest project of all time, which is to bring more love into the world, and there is no greater good. So let yourself be part of it. Second, I say this to a lot of women and men I've coached, you get to want love to turn out the way you want it to turn out. Now, just because everything in your life so far was a disappointment doesn't mean you can protect your heart by setting your sights way low down here. If you're going to struggle with love, struggle for what you really want, and you want the real thing, trust me, the real thing. When I ask people what they really want and they say, oh, um, a life partner, or they say um, a long-term relationship or companion, or they talk about getting needs met and things like that. Don't set your aim at what you think you'll likely have to settle for. Set your aim for what you want. And what you want is the one. You'll have plenty of chances later to lose that person or to never find them or to settle for number two or three or four. There's no guarantees here, but I'm telling you, get clear what you really want and wear it with pride. Don't act cool about it. Don't crap fit. You know that word? I have a whole video about it. You get so good at fitting yourself to crap when you're a kid that you, you can't stop. You take a crappy person or a situation and in your mind, you make it okay. You think, oh, I can make this work. Well, don't make it work. Don't try to hedge your bets and pretend you're okay with whatever or you're gonna get whatever. You've been getting whatever all of your life. And that empty space inside of you, it's made of whatever, okay? The only version of you that anyone's going to fall in love with, with real love, is the real you. And if your childhood PTSD is mucking that up with a lot of defenses and fear and anger and grabbiness, then healing is very likely going to be a very big asset for you. And you might need to heal first a little bit. And in that case, you are exactly on the right channel. And finally, the third thing, and heads up, I gotta talk about God here, and if you're not into that, I invite you to just adapt what I'm saying to what makes sense to you. But don't let anybody tell you that the idea of perfect love is crazy. It is the most real thing there is, actually. It's how we're shown spiritual reality. And it's an experience of seeing through God's eyes, if only for a little bit, right? So, so that we can know the truth of our oneness with all things. That's the place where we want to be. That's where we truly live. We're there all the time, even though we'll almost never be conscious of it. Now, trauma can tear us out of knowing this ever, but it can't actually take it away. It can't change what is our home. You're part of it. And through your love of another person, if you can keep healing and open up to it, you can experience it, that oneness. That's the thing you're craving, oneness. Now, maybe you've experienced this. It's not a trick played by chemistry. It's, it's your awakening, and it's an intense spiritual experience for anyone. And if you have that trauma in your past, your attachment issues can kick in, and you'll want to, like, grab hold and stop the fear. And unfortunately, this can take you right out of that experience. And it doesn't always work out like you'd hoped, but whatever you do, even if you screw it up, it expands you and it raises you up into who you really are. Now, I get letters from people and they say, oh, but you don't realize I'm almost 40 or I'm 51 or I'm 67 or I'm 75. 
Here's what I learned from my friend Gladys, who found her great love at age 80, just a few years before she died. There's still time. And for all you know, the greatest love you could possibly know may still lie ahead of you, especially if you keep healing from what happened in the past. And that longing you feel when you're lonely, especially now, has a message for you, that it's real and it's pointing the way toward your home. I have a special assignment for all of you who might be feeling empty at the moment. Maybe you're feeling depressed or hopeless or a little bit lost or like things have gotten so bad that there just isn't any good in the world anymore. And this is one of my special guided relaxation videos. You don't need to even watch it. You can just close your eyes and listen to it if you want. As I take you on a tour of experiences you've had in the past, not all the trauma and the bad stuff. You can put that outside the door for now. What I'm inviting you to focus on as you listen is the good in the world. And there is so much good. And when we give it our attention, it has a way of seeping into us and resetting some of the areas where we're sad and stuck and locked down and having trouble seeing any good at all. So this is an assignment I'm going to give you. And I'm gonna take you on a memory tour of just a few of the experiences you've had and the people you've had the good fortune to encounter who brought some good into your world. So what I invite you to do is, as you keep listening, is to get into a comfy chair or a sofa and settle in, just very, very comfortable. And if you like, you can close your eyes. If you're driving, obviously don't close your eyes. <laughs> but you can go through the guided relaxation exercise even while you're walking or driving or doing work with your hands. Um, it's not gonna be that deep of a traveling away. You're gonna be thinking of things. So when you're comfortable, here's your assignment. I'm going to be listing a series of positive experiences that you might have had, and I'll be inviting you to dwell on those for a little bit. And I'll go slowly so you have time to think. And if I mention an experience you haven't had yet, that's okay. Just stay with the exercise. I'll tell you what to do if that's the case. And if you want to stop at any time, that's fine too. So once you're in a safe spot, just close your eyes, or not, <laughs> and just feel your trusty body in a state of rest. Maybe you have a few aches and pains or something you don't like about your body, but just for this moment, give your body some appreciation for all it does for you. It allows you to live and breathe and be alive. And if you're lucky, it gives you hands to gesture and touch to comfort people or pets, kitties and doggies who you love. And your body allows you to express yourself with, with your voice and your facial expressions and your speech. And if you have vision and hearing and taste and smell, not everybody has them, but whatever you have, you have the extraordinary power to sense your environment. And this is no small thing. Your body is good and it was made so that you could live and learn and bring good into the world. So just give some love and appreciation for a moment to your magnificent living body. What a miracle it is. You may have criticisms of it and things that you wish would change about it, but set those aside and just feel what an instrument of good that you've been given in the form of your body. All right, now I invite you to begin thinking about some of the other people you've encountered in your life. I know some people hurt you and that's part of your story and maybe it's still hard for you, but for the next several minutes, I'm going to lead you in calling to mind some of the dear people who brought good into your life. And yes, sometimes it's the same people who also did some harm, but all the same, let's visit the good that's come your way. Think of someone who once comforted you when you were sick or grieving or injured. Can you think of that person? Were the little things they did, the attention they gave you, the touch, the reassurance? Did it help you go from a state of fear or pain to a cozy feeling of ease? Did it help you know that you were safe to go to sleep and to heal inside? Remember what a good feeling that was. That person brought good into the world. So just take a moment to appreciate them for that. Now think of a person who introduced you to a work of art, like a book, or a painting or a song that resonated for you in the most beautiful way and opened up your imagination. You hadn't known about that wonderful work before, but someone who loved it and felt enthusiastic shared it with you. They brought something good to you and into the world by doing that. So just in your mind, 
Just take a moment and give thanks to the person who did that for you. Right now, think of someone who praised you for your natural ability in something. Maybe when you were a kid, someone noticed that you were a fast runner or a responsible helper around the house or that you were kind to the pets. Maybe the praise you received was later for a job well done or a brave action you took or for a thoughtful gift you gave. And the person who praised you helped you see what was good about you. And that was their way to bring more good into the world. There is good in the world, but some people have a way of bringing more. So think of someone who got you out of danger at some point. If you're listening, I know you didn't always feel safe, but was there someone who stepped in at some time and pulled you out of danger's way? They stood up for you against someone who was gonna hurt you maybe, or they taught you how to protect yourself, to fight, or they pulled you back from a choice you made or were about to make to go down some destructive path. That person brought some good into the world. So just take a moment to acknowledge a time or two when this happened for your benefit. All right, next I'd like you to think of someone who taught you a skill that helped you earn money. Being able to earn money is such a gift, right? Was it someone who taught you to use a computer or drive a car? Uh, Did they help you be a good writer or a good builder or to be good at cleaning? to be a great leader, to be good at caring for other people, maybe to do something clinical for others, to do research, to cook, to be of service to others. Whatever has allowed you to earn money and eat and keep a roof over your head, give thanks for a moment to the person who taught you how to do that. You weren't born knowing that, they taught you. And they brought good into the world in this way. Okay, now think of someone who modeled for you how to be a good and moral person. Now, none of us are born with that knowledge, but we learn it from the people around us. Even if some of the people around us were doing bad things, there were other people in our midst, neighbors, teachers, friends, even characters on TV shows, were modeling for us how to navigate in the world and how to act with honor and courage and kindness. Can you think of someone who modeled that for you in a way that impacted who you became? Let's give them a moment of your silent appreciation for bringing good into the world. Has there been someone who helped you get organized when life was overwhelming? Maybe they gave you a place to stay or helped you with housework or helped you clean out a garage that you couldn't even walk in because you had gotten so burdened with everything going on in your life. So let's take a moment to honor those people with your appreciation silently. They brought good into the world. All right, is there someone who defended you when you were unfairly accused of something? That's a terrible feeling, and it means the world when someone stands up for you. So if that's happened for you, hold them in your heart too. And is there a person or a group of people who introduced you to all the good things in nature? Did they make you a nature lover? Did they teach you about animals and trees and water? Hold these people in your heart. They're very special. Thank them for bringing good into the world. Was there someone who showed you how to stop drinking or using drugs right when you couldn't do that yourself? Give great thanks to them. Maybe they did it for someone you love, helped them get clean and sober, and that in turn affected your life. We're all grateful for that. Was there someone who fed you something delicious, who made a holiday feel special? That is bringing good in the world. Take a moment to appreciate that person. Is there someone who helped you work out your problems with another person, a spouse, a parent, a child? When we support other people in having closer relationships and more harmony, this is a big way to bring good into the world. Is there someone who invited you over when you felt alone and gave you a place at their table? They brought good into the world. Let's thank them. Was there someone who gave you a kind word when you felt ashamed and made you feel reassured that you were going to be okay and be able to turn this around? They brought good into the world. Is there someone who encouraged you and helped you see that your life is important and has purpose? I want you to give special appreciation to them for bringing good into the world. 
And if you haven't yet met the person who does any of these things for you, maybe for some of them, I'll tell you what you can do instead of thanking someone who hasn't done that for you yet is you can be the person who gives that to someone else. Because that's the great secret, that when it's done for us, it brings good into the world. But whether it's ever been done for us, we can do it for others and bring good into the world. And that good just bounces right back at us. As you think of all these good people, it's almost as if there's been a council of angels who've been with you all along. The people who showed up when you desperately needed help and you thought you had no one, but also when you didn't think you need help and they were there for you anyway. So here's what I invite you to do. Just let it in. Let it in that even though your life has had its hard times, there have been good times and especially great kindnesses done for your benefit by good people who, whether they knew it or not, were bringing good into the world. And because they did this good and because it lifted you up each time it happened, I encourage you now to take your place among them, to be one of the people who brings good into the world. And as you heal from all the difficulties and stresses of your past, you'll have more and more space in your heart and in your life to be aware of the good that's needed in this world and to let it come through you. The horrible irony of surviving abuse and neglect in childhood is that the more you were hurt back then, the more likely you are to adopt these self-defeating behaviors that make the effects of the original trauma even worse. These are things like the people you allow into your life, the way you take care of yourself, the choices you make about partners and jobs and money and where you live, the people you admire, the things you say, and of course, the way you act. Now we all know how a rough childhood can increase the chances of really bad outcomes in life. And I'm sure you know people who were hit even harder than you were, people who are sick, addicted, isolated, involved in violence and so on. When the healing never gets to begin, there's always a danger of that negative progression. It's easy to spot this tendency in other people, but sometimes really hard to see in ourselves. We go into denial and we defend what we're doing, believing that it's necessary to feel okay, but it doesn't actually make things better. Changing things makes things better. And you can turn around self-defeating behaviors into a positive progression and make the trauma stop. Now, maybe you're at that point or maybe you're not there yet. There's not time in this video to cover everything I teach in my courses and coaching, but I wanna give you some encouragement and hope here by just describing the signs of what it looks like when you're not re-traumatizing yourself, okay? I teach this because for me, this was the hardest part of healing. And I mean, yes, the stuff that happened to me when I was a child was not great. But in the end, it was the stuff I did to myself, the bad relationships, the chain smoking, the lashing out at people. If you've taken any of my courses, you know my story, but I wasn't getting better for a long time. And because of all the hurtful situations I was putting myself in and dragging other people into, I was getting worse. But then I changed. And it's not like I'm all perfect now. I'm a work in progress, just like everyone. But if you're stuck in a pattern like I used to be, I get it, I understand, and I'm here to show you a better way, okay? So you wanna hear some of the signs when you're healed from your CPTSD symptoms, okay? You're not gonna have all these signs, but you can see if you relate to some of them, all right? One is you no longer tend to see things in black and white terms. People, yourself, situations, you no longer hold them up as all good or put them down as all bad you begin to appreciate the complexity of things, the way people can have faults but be decent people anyway. You'll have less outrage and more curiosity. We could really use more people in the world like that right now. You'll have less impatience and more persistence. You'll lose the attraction to extreme views or authority figures and gain the ability to interact with a variety of people. Relationships where one person dominates will become more equal or they'll fade away and it will become less necessary to cut people out of your life. Number two is you'll have a natural desire to care for your body. Part of it is because you're gonna have less drama and more energy to do things like take a walk or floss your teeth or shop for clothes that actually look good on you. And you'll feel a little better. And so now when 
you're feeling too schlumpy to leave the house or you're tired from watching TV really late, it'll feel not worth it anymore. It'll become more possible to face your addictions and take action to overcome them. One little step after the other will lead to more clarity and more enthusiasm for life and you'll want to do more good things for yourself. Isn't that cool? Number three is, and this is another one where an old behavior will start to feel awful, and that's around the way you eat. Being at the effect of past trauma can lead to everything from obesity and eating disorders to a tendency to deal with stress by binging on carbs and sugar. And these foods can be calming at first, but they can become dysregulating in the long run. And as you heal, you won't want that feeling. And in fact, if sugar and carbs are your weak spot, I've got a quiz called the Food Sensitivity Quiz from Susan Pierce Thompson. I'll put that into the description section below. Number four is you'll lose that compulsive desire to binge on TV and video games and just plain looking at your phone all the time. If you're someone who's been into that stuff enough to interfere with your sleep or your eating or your job or your ability to be present with the people in your life, then the release from screen addiction will be life-changing for you. And I know I have to look in a screen to say this to you and you have to watch a screen to hear it, that's true. But everything in moderation, right? All right, the fifth sign that you're healing your CPTSD is that you won't be tempted anymore to fudge the truth. Things like exaggerating or hiding important information about yourself or even lying about things. And part of the reason is there's gonna be nothing that you need to hide or to feel ashamed about. You won't have so many problems, so you'll be comfortable being more honest about what's going on in your life. But it's also because just being real, being honestly yourself feels better and you'll start to have real discomfort when you're not being real. You'll actually want the truth to filter through your life. And if there's anyone still in your life who can't handle who you really are and how you really feel, then, you know, that's okay. Maybe they're not meant to be there. So maybe when they're gone, even though saying goodbye is gonna be sad, there's going to be a big, nice space where someone who loves you and accepts you can be. The sixth sign that your CPTSD is healing is that your work life will start to go better, okay? You won't stay stuck in unfulfilling work. You'll change your relationship to that job or you'll get a new one. And if a lack of work has been your problem, all the good changes happening will make it easier to get work and earn money that supports you and the people who count on you. As you heal, you're gonna learn how to steer clear of exploitative or abusive employers. And you'll lose your appetite for conflicts on the job. You'll get the ability to show up, to do good work, to be an encourager of your coworkers, and to be an advocate for yourself and your ideas when you need to. It's gonna feel good. You can hold your head up and feel proud of your work. The seventh sign that your CPTSD is healing is that you're gonna lose your interest in assigning blame to yourself or other people for problems. And you're gonna focus instead on finding good solutions. You'll feel less angry about the situation. You'll feel less irritable. And when something is your fault, it's gonna be easier to just own it and apologize. And when someone else owes you an apology, but they don't give it to you, you're not gonna dwell on it. Most people don't ever apologize. And when you have peace inside, you're not gonna worry about that too much. Another thing you're probably gonna to wanna to steer clear of, it'll become uncomfortable, is blamey news and social media posts. And the people in your life may not know why, but they're gonna feel better about themselves when they're around you and you don't engage in that sort of blame thinking. The eighth sign that you're healing is that any attraction you once had to unavailable partners and troubled friends is gonna let go of you. I talk a lot about this in all my videos about healing relationships, but so much life damage is done by this one self-defeating behavior, which is connecting and bonding with and staying with people who are trouble. Or you end up avoiding any kind of intimacy with people at all, even though it's what you long for. Or you abuse intimacy by acting out, all right? playing the field so much that you cause yourself to have no intimacy. This is one part of CPTSD that can be hard to heal just by deciding to change. And it cuts to the heart of the trauma wound is how we relate in romantic relationships, romantic and sexual relationships. 
But when you've made real progress in other areas, it's going to be easier to stop re-traumatizing yourself in these ways. The spell is broken. Uh, you're not going to believe that like, you know, some other person is the panacea who's going to solve all your problems. There's more peace when you're single. And the possibility of harmony and real love starts to appear on the horizon when you do meet someone because you have that peace. All right, the ninth sign that you're healing is that you start to prefer reality to fantasy and the tendency to check out by spending too much time in a fantasy romance or fantastical dreams of business success. It's really common for people in the middle of trauma, but in the end, it's just another way to avoid real problems and the actions that you need to take. When you're healing, it feels less necessary. And when you catch yourself daydreaming, you can come back where you can actually connect with people and put your goals into action, which is right here, right now. And finally, number 10, the sign that you're healing is that your material well-being starts to come together in a positive way. Now, most people in the world, including most happy people, live good lives without being rich or famous. And some people live on very little money at all. Financial hardship can actually fall on anyone, but when you're free of trauma, it's more possible to earn a steady income, let go of get rich quick schemes that are just fantasy and live within your means and release the fear of the past when maybe you were a few hundred dollars away from homelessness too many days out of the year, right? I know when I was a kid, we had a lot of fear about that. It took me years to lose that. It all gets better at the same time, a little here, a little there. You can sleep at night, you can handle hard days, you can hold your head up even though you make mistakes because you're not sabotaging yourself in ways that make you feel ashamed. And this is what healing feels like when you're not re-traumatized all the time. You're not in CPTSD. So don't get discouraged. There are things you can do to start your healing right now. All right.